So, so we're working through. Does that work? Uh, yep, yeah, we can see your basic slides, the slide oh, deck. Yeah, Did you problem. want to try hitting play? I So I am on full slide view on my side. That's the problem I had before. Um, right, so you somehow need to switch, switch over <laughs> so that we see your full slide and you see the up next. Uh, ah. I think there's a there's a way of um, doing it, but there's a function I don't remember in there. <laughs> it's does anyone have any advice? I think it's in the slide share. Uh, uh, the well, the share screen. Uh, oh. Should I just send you the slides? That might be safer. Um, sure. No. What can well, you see? Um, I just mentioned if we use if you're using two monitors, it may be that it's sharing the wrong one. But if um... no, I'm only using one, and I know there's a function somewhere, but it's a bit. Um, it's not intuitive. Uh, no. So it's under um, slideshow. Uh, I'll, I'll send you my slides. I think that's safer. OK. OK. Hopefully, the um, it's not going to be too too large a file. I don't think so. I'll, let's see. <laughs> Nothing's come through yet. Should be coming through soon. It says Royal Society Chemistry. It was. Um... Yeah.
Did you get them? Not yet. Okay. I'll try again in the meantime, if we have time. Okay. I'm just looking in. It's downloading. Let's go back. Did you want to share your screen again, Cecile? Okay, I'll try. Um... I'll try sharing my whole screen. And then hit the slides. Does this work? Well, we can see your screen. Oh no, okay, because I can I can just see my slides now. Okay. Yeah, it's just happening. like it's trying to share the wrong screen. Uh, I've tried both screens. I, do, I really don't know what's okay. happening. I've been going over it several times now. Um, okay. I think, so there's a, let me try again something else. Okay. Um, so now I'm only showing, sharing the PowerPoint slide before it was the whole okay. screen. And I've hit the whole screen. And can you see it now or not? So we can see just the PowerPoint. So if oh. you hit, you're hitting play on, have you hit play? Yeah. Yeah, so I, on my side, I can see the slideshow, basically. Okay, if you make this, make the slides big, and then we can still see the slides, but we can also see all the function. Yep, yeah, no, that still works. That works? Yep, yeah. yeah, that's working. Okay, let's do that then. I'll try again once more. I just don't know. Uh, this doesn't work for you. We can still see the slides, um, the, the, the presentation side of the slides. Don't, Cecile, don't worry for now. I think we okay, are I'll just um, I'll show you. in good shape. Let me, let's, let's get cracking. Okay. Brilliant. Great, let me bring up, let's see if mine works this time. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, it is a very warm welcome um, to the second day of the uh, GOC Global Youth Forum uh, on Net Zero. And we are now entering um, the phase of the um, uh, summit where we're beginning to look at specific forums the, with relation to the sustainable uh, development goals. Um, my name is Dr. Peter Walton. Um, I work at the University of Oxford, and um, we are um, very pleased to be able to host um, this uh, particular sub-forum, which is thinking about um, climate in relation to nature and biodiversity. We've invited a huge range of speakers um, to uh, present on their research um, on this theme of climate in relation to nature. And there's a huge range re reflecting the huge range of research and impacts on rather research on impacts and solutions. So we're really excited to have this broad um, awareness of, 
of the issues um, that, that uh, we need to understand in order to do something about it. We're going to ask um, each of the speakers to do um, just a short presentation of five minutes or so. Um, and then we'll, uh, as you can see, work in small groups and then we can have some groups, um, some Q&A uh, for 10 minutes uh, for each group. If you've got questions as we're going along, by all means put them in the uh, chat. Otherwise, if you're ready to, excuse me, a bit of a dry voice, but if you're um, uh, interested in, in asking a question, then please raise your hands and we can unmute you and you can direct your questions. We'll aim to finish promptly at two o'clock, um, which was when we were scheduled to do so. Um, and I understand that the uh, presentation is being recorded. Um, so please be aware um, that any questions uh, that you might ask uh, will be uh, recorded and uh, put online for posterity. The other thing to add is that all the um, videos of uh, the presentations can be seen online. If you go to the um, uh, Climate um, uh, X 2021 website, I'll remind you of the link later, you'll be able to uh, access them there. But first of all, what I want to do is to welcome Dr. Cecile Giardin, who uh, works with me here at the University of Oxford. And she's going to give us a, a quick overview on the research that she's been doing um, on the importance of nature in, in understanding climate change. So, Cecile, can I hand over to you now? Uh, yes, thank you. I Lovely. My video isn't working, but I think that's on your end. Uh, you should be able to use your video yes, as well. I my video because the host has stopped it, but I'll, I'll share my screen whilst you just figure that one out. Okay. So um, I'm just here to ask me to do a quick introduction on nature-based solutions to climate change, the potential for climate mitigation and for climate change adaptation. Um, I'd like to, I hope you can this, see my screen. Um, to start by um, defining nature-based solutions. So I've been working a lot on uh, nature-based solutions. And to put it simply, nature-based solutions involve working with nature to address societal challenge. This is to provide benefits for both human well-being and for biodiversity. And more specifically, we're talking about actions that involve the protection, restoration, and management of natural or semi-natural ecosystem, the sustainable management of working lands and aquatic ecosystems, and the creation of ecosystems in urban areas. So uh, uh, you may have heard the term blue-green infrastructure. Blue or green infrastructure, these mean um, restoring green areas in, in urban areas or restoring water uh, watersheds and, and um, aquatic systems in urban areas. Uh, it also it includes a range of ecosystems. So when we're talking about nature-based solutions, please, we're not only talking about forests, we're talking about uh, peat bogs and seagrasses, uh, as well as sustainable agriculture, wet, wetland restoration, kelp forests, um, coral reefs, and many, many more ecosystems. The concept is rooted in the understanding that ecosystems support societies in multiple ways. So um, for example, you, you must have heard a lot about um, ecosystems storing carbon, in that case addressing climate change mitigation, but also uh, ecosystems providing food and water security, or protection from climate extremes, from storm surges, uh, from floods, etc. And then the concept also arises from the understanding that biodiversity loss and climate change share some of the, the same drivers, and some of the same solutions. So two of the biggest problems we face this century um, could theoretically be addressed by nature-based solutions. Here are some examples of nature-based solutions, um, just to put it in a, in a practical context. We have, for example, cocoa agroforestry in Sierra Leone, 
which has um, demonstrated to be more profitable uh, because it provides a, it, 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 it's achieved at a lower cost than conventional production. It improves local livelihoods and um, through avoided deforestation projects, uh, it improves biodiversity and saves an estimated 500,000 tons of carbon a year. So climate mitigation. Another example is community wetland restoration in the Peruvian Andes that had shown, has shown to increase carbon storage, improve water supplies, reduce erosion and landslide risk, and improve habitat for wild species such as the vicuña. It also improves water regulation that's um, reviving natural pastures, hence livestock herds are healthier and communities have a more reliable source of income. So there are many socioeconomic implications of uh, restoring, protecting and better management of ecosystems. Another example is the urban forests in, in Wisconsin in the States uh, that has shown to increase um, tree covers to reduce daily temperatures during heat waves and increasing carbon sequestration. Uh, and we, we also have seen, especially during the uh, pandemic, the strong links between um, green areas in urban settings, uh, nature and human health, mental and physical human health. So with all this in, in mind, um, there's a big question. Nature-based solutions are widely views, viewed as a win-win strategy to address the biggest global challenges of the century, as I just said, but the potential contribution of nature-based solutions to mitigating climate change still remains controversial. So how much do nature-based solutions, if we implement them at scale globally, how much do they actually contribute to our net zero goal and to, um, and to reducing warming? So as this race to net zero gains momentum, we urgently need to know, decision makers urgently need to know what's nature's place in the race to net zero. And to address this, we've been looking at how much nature-based solutions could contribute to limiting peak warming to well below two degrees C this century, whilst pursuing efforts to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. And that's in a context that's relevant to the Paris Agreement. Uh, so, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, so um, we've been looking at this question with a uh, um, bunch of scientists from uh, around the world uh, who didn't necessarily see eye to eye when we started asking the question, but how much can nature-based solutions contribute to mitigating climate change? So um, again, looking at this in a context relevant to the Paris Agreement, which says keeping peak warming, which is the, the, the maximum warming the world will get to, to well below two degrees this century, whilst pursuing efforts to limiting warming to 1.5. Um, and um, so we, we, we took a, um, a model by uh, Bronson, Griscom and team that was published in 2017 on uh, natural, on the, the contribution of natural climate solutions. So natural climate solutions is a subset of nature-based solutions that specifically focuses on greenhouse gas mitigation. The contribution of natural climate solutions to uh, mitigation globally. And this, this comes out with um, an estimate, a global estimate of saving 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year at a cost effective, um, cost effective, it, it's important to understand that this is at a cost if effective uh, rate of um, less than a hundred dollars of megagram CO2 equivalent per year. And um, so half of this comes from avoided emissions and half of this comes from enhanced sinks. And it's important to understand this, this division because when we're talking about reaching net zero, we're talking about, first of all, we can't say it enough, the priority for reaching net zero is keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And that means uh, decarbonizing our economy at unprecedented rate, as well as avoiding emissions from land degradation. From, so that in, in terms of nature-based solutions, that's 
translates to protecting intact ecosystems, forests, grasslands, um, peatlands, and, and many other ecosystems. And you can see here that half of the mitigation potential of nature-based solutions comes from avoided emissions, five gigaton CO2 per year. The other half comes from enhanced sinks. And that is mainly, the majority comes from better management of working lands. So these are lands that we're already using for agricultural or, or fiber security, food security for agricultural purposes. And by shifting to a, a more climate smart, nature positive um, practices, we will enhance sinks and avoid emissions from these working lands. And that's 40% a, a of the climate mitigation of, um, of nature-based solutions. The rest 20% comes from restoring native covers. So restoring ecosystems. Again, we're talking about forests as well as wetlands, grasslands, savannas, uh, et cetera, and peatlands and more. So it's good to put it in the perspective of um, the priorities really are to protect our intact ecosystems, to better manage our working land and to restore ecosystems to support the um, mitigation potential of nature-based solutions. Uh, I'm just trying to shift that. Um, so it's important again to understand that these estimates come well constrained. When we estimate the potential of nature-based solutions, we have to think about biodiversity safeguards, restoring for forest ecosystems in areas that are ecologically appropriate for forests. You don't want to be planting a forest on a perfectly healthy savanna, for example, um, excluding boreal bi biomes due to the albedo effect. We need to take into consideration the saturation of ecosystem carbon sequestration rates. So after um, uh, 80 years, a mature forest will come into approximately will come into uh, saturation and won't be sequestering at, at rapid as, as rapid rates. We need to take into account food security, fiber security, and most importantly, the complexities of governance issues, not shy away from the complexities of the social context, the local social context. And that includes um, taking into account land rights, conflicts between land ownership and management and inequalities in the region. And again, this, these estimates are very sensitive to cost. So if we increase the, the willingness of society to pay for carbon, for CO2, uh, we will increase the potential of nature-based solutions. And we took this model and asked the question again, uh, how, how does this then impact our peak warming? How does it impact limiting peak warming to well below two degrees this century whilst pursuing efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C? And so to do this, we, insert, we included the um, mitigation potential estimates in an IPCC model. And uh, the, this is the, the IPCC model that you will find on the first page of the report to policymakers from the 1.5 degree report um, IPCC that came out in 2019. Um, the blue line is our trajectory if we are peaking at 1.5 degree and the dark blue line, so the pale blue line is if we're peaking at 1.5, the, the dark blue line is if we're peaking at two degrees C's. You can see that once we include nature-based solutions in this, you have the, the dashed lines. So the dashed lines is with nature-based solutions. By mid-century, by the middle of the century, in about 2045, nature-based solutions will reduce peak warming of the 1.5 trajectory by 0.1 degrees C, which is relatively limited because the less time nature-based solutions have to act, um, the less they will be uh, st storing carbon in this case or uh, avoiding emissions. But then when we, as we go along, we can see that there's more contribution and there's a significant contribution. When we get to a peak in two degree, um, nature-based solutions will contribute to avoiding warming by up to 0.3 degrees C. And when you think about the difference 0.5 degree makes uh, in, in the, the IPCC and the IPBES reports, we can see the difference it makes in terms of, in ecological terms to warm the planet by 0.5 degree, you can see that 0.3 degree is a significant proportion of that. And um, so 
later on in the century, again, they continue, this is crucial, they continue to act up to the end of the century and have a very important role to play in cooling our planet. So the conclusions from this is that nature-based solutions can provide a real but limited mitigation benefit in the short term. We shouldn't put too much emphasis on how much they can contribute to our net zero uh, goals. We have to be realistic about this. But nature-based solutions have a powerful role for reducing warming and cooling our planet in the long term up to the end of the century. So it's important to invest in, in solutions that are designed for longevity. And this means solutions that are ecologically sound, socially equitable, um, designed in collaboration with the stewards of the ecosystem, so the local communities that are, that are working on these ecosystems, um, designed and implemented in collaboration with them, and, um, and, and paying closer attention to the long-term long carbon storage potential of these projects. And then on the other side, nature-based solutions have a very important role in adapting to climate change. So there's there are decades of work providing strong evidence that nature-based solutions can deliver a multitude of local, ecological and socioeconomic be benefits. Um, these have been reviewed extensively in this article for, by uh, Chausson, Alexandre Chausson et al. from the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative. You can find it on our nature-based solutions evidence.info um, platform. Uh, and here you can find a multitude of examples that show uh, that are peer reviewed that show that the protection, restoration, improved management and creation of ecosystems have, um, have adaptation uh, benefits. For example, protecting ecosystems defend against storm surges, saltwater intrusion and erosion, or restoring forests and wetlands secures and regulates water supplies, shields communities and infrastructures from flood erosion, landslide, or um, agroforestry, or the beautiful example of floating gardens can increase the resilience of food supplies. Um, increase resilience from attacks from pests, disease or climate extremes. So all in all, this shows that nature-based solutions can help people adapt to climate change whilst achieving the sustainable development goals, protecting biodiversity and mitigating climate change. There's a strong business case for biodiversity. Um, the, if you read the Dasgupta review, you will see that biodiversity underpins um, business and in many, many ways. And in, to, in recognition of this in 2021, the, the last summer, the G7 met in uh, Cornwall and backed the introduction for the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure. And this means that businesses from 2023 will need to report their impact on nature as well as their impact on climate, which they've been doing since 2015. But when we're talking about nature-based solutions, there's a, a potential to um, to go into rapidly go into the conversation of carbon offsets. So how do how can investing in nature based solutions help us offset emissions? Again, we can't say it enough. The priority for reaching net zero is keeping fossil fuel in the ground. So it's decarbonizing our economy. But for those residual emissions um, that uh, that that can't be kept in the ground at the moment in the short term, we do need to look to negative emission technologies and that includes nature-based solutions. We need to be clear about what the pitfalls for ecological carbon offsets are. Investing in nature-based solutions is distracting, maybe distracting from the need to rapidly phase out fossil fuels. And this overemphasis on tree planting for rapid carbon gains rather than a wide range of nature-based solutions that are monitored, that, are, um, that, that have a metric of success based on biodiversity, uh, climate, as well as effects on uh, social equity and local communities. This emphasis on rapid carbon gain could have adverse impacts on local communities. So we're talking about displacing communities for, um, for, for plantations, for example, that happens. Um, adverse impacts on biodiversity, if you're replacing a perfectly safe or perfectly healthy ecosystem like a savanna or a grassland with a, a rapidly growing plantation. 
you won't have a, a positive impact on biodiversity and you won't even have a positive impact on climate mitigation because it's not a long-term solution. The, the, the ecosystem won't thrive in that uh, climate. So all in all, we caution against focusing on carbon as the main metric of success for nature-based solutions because it poses a threat to biodiversity, human rights and the climate. And out of this, uh, for the past few years, we've had, uh, we've had many organizations working very hard on creating one clear voice on sustainable nature-based solutions. So we have nature-based solutions guidelines from the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative that have been signed by a multitude of international organizations and NGOs. There are uh, four clear guidelines. The IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions provides these eight uh, eight criteria that you can see here on the right. So addressing societal challenges, designing at scale, um, ensuring biodiversity net gain, economic feasibility, inclusive governance, uh, as well as balancing the trade-offs. So trade-offs between carbon gains and biodiversity gains, for example, uh, adaptive management, making sure that the, the, it's inclusive and adaptive management of these pro, pro projects and mainstreaming and sustainability. Um, so we just need to be clear on what's needed. We can't shy away from the complexities of biodiversity and social equity uh, the, because if we we've learned from the, the past few decades of experience that limited framing, framing results in limited solutions and that can be dangerous and have uh, negative impacts. But in conclusion, I just want to say that this, it's clear that this century calls for an economic thinking that unleashes the uh, potential of transformative change and thinking that encourages the development of bioeconomies, as well as restores humans as full participants in the natural processes that support life on Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed um, for your presentation and that overview of the importance of nature and nature-based solutions um, and the importance of, of, of biodiversity, which really sets the tone of what it is that we want to be able to address um, with the presentations uh, going forward through till two o'clock um, UK time. Um, I'm mindful that we are running a little bit behind time um, which is uh, largely due to technical issues right at the very start. So what I'm going to propose we do is a slight change in how we um, run this, this particular event. So rather than stopping and having um, uh, Q&As at, at different points through, throughout the presentations, is that we actually run the presentations through together um, and then with any time left over at the end that we can uh, provide Q&A uh, opportunities then. So I apologize uh, for, for the change in, in format, but I hope that it will then give our presenters enough time to, to get through their presentations. I would encourage you to use the chat function. So if you do have any questions as our presenters um, uh, um, are, are delivering um, their, their papers, then, then please do pop them in there. If we can't address them immediately, then we can always um, ask the presenters to um, get back to you um, at, at a later date. So without further ado, um, Zaid, if you would like to uh, take the floor, we'd be very uh, interested to I would. hear a little bit more about hydropower. Okay, can you hear me? Is it all uh, coming through? It's all brilliant. Thank you very uh, much indeed. Loud fantastic. And Allow me to just uh, get my PowerPoint up, hopefully with no issues. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, I'm hoping you can, you can see this. Is that all visible for everyone? We can. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right. That was all good. Okay. Right. So uh, I'll just jump straight into it. So uh, my name is Ed Arbid Wahid. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Salford. Uh, my degree has been funded by the Alpine Glacier Project. I recommend you follow their work and also follow me. Uh, and now that the, uh, the politeness is out of the way, let's get into the research. 
So with hydropower in the Swiss Alps, the biggest problem that you see is the fact that glacial retreat whoops, in the Swiss Alps is essentially uh, an inevitable process. Even with the goals that uh, Cecile uh, just uh, outlined for us, uh, you will still see a massive loss of the glacierized area uh, and especially a massive loss of runoff. Uh, and this has a knock-on impact for hydropower systems in the area, because, of course, you're going to see a loss of water firstly, but uh, but but the more immediate risk is one of uh, increased sedimentation. Now, you may think that's not such a big big deal, but then you realize that sedimentation, uh, because glaciers are uh, massive providers of sediment into a system, is the leading cause of failure and inefficiencies for hydropower. So then what's the... Oh, not too far. So what's the solution? Uh, well, research suggests that... Uh, these systems will self-regulate the delivery of uh, sediment downstream. There's a sort of uh, negative feedback loop system that can occur. Uh, and if this phenomenon could be understood, we could use it and we could manipulate it uh, to the benefit of uh, these systems without having to resort to uh, heavy engineering processes uh, or, or heavy upstream dams that would uh, ruin ecology and also ruin the very aesthetics of these uh, very beautiful mountains. But the other issue is the fact that these there's no real uh, records of sediments in the uh, in the Alps. Neither are there good models due to the difficulties of high mountain environments and the difficulties of computing for these sorts of things. These things have only recently become very possible. So hence, uh, my research aims to develop this understanding of the alpine proglacial and paraglacial systems uh, to ensure sustainable hydropower development using the systems that are in place from nature. Uh, and we've done that through the following objectives. I, I won't, just for lack of time, I won't go into them too, too much detail. But essentially, through modeling, we are att attempting to solve for these problems. So the study site that uh, currently the study has uh, looked at so far is on the Finland Glacier, which is in the southern Valley Alps of Switzerland. Uh, you can see here this little red dot that is the uh, gauging site. And here is the snout of the glacier. And this uh, 1,000 uh, meter or so area is my area of interest, my area of sediment dynamics, if you will. So in terms of how you perform sediment modeling on this sort of thing, we used a, a program called HEC RAS6, which was uh, developed by the uh, American military. Uh, and essentially to make this sort of stuff work, you need three components. You need a surface, your terrain and mesh. You need your flow, which is your discharge data. And you, of course, need sediment data, which due to COVID re restrictions, we had to uh, gain from a sort of desk study of uh, drone surveys collected um, from previous years. Uh, here is an image of said drone survey. This is very high resolution uh, drone photography, uh, which allowed us to take uh, 6,033 uh, stone samples from across this reach, uh, randomly distributed using a random algorithm to select them. Uh, and then I went through individually and painstakingly measured each one, uh, generating the sample sizes for each of these zones. These zones are all 15 meter contours. And then each stone within a zone was classified uh, as, as according to the Wentworth scale of, of, of stone classification, uh, all the way up from clays to boulders. And from there, a, a gradation curve was created. You, you can see in the uh, upcoming full paper and in the, uh, the full version of this PowerPoint, the um, different ones of these, I've just got the one here. Uh, and each of these gradations can be measured and uh, handled by the model in order to uh, compute for that section. Uh, so in order for more realism, however, we had to figure out how to, how to layer them. So essentially for zones one through four and seven through eight, which are the restricted areas of the flow, there is an armoring, which is essentially uh, protection on top of uh, sediments to allow for a simulation of how, how things can be hidden by other class, I guess. And then for areas where there's no armoring, which you observe from satellite imagery, there's, I mean, there, there isn't any armoring, I guess. Uh, and, then, and then of course, after that, you have to think about parameters. Now models like HEC RAS use existing 1D models uh, that have been around for a very long time to put together this 2D model. But the issue is, is that none of these 1D models have ever been tested for something of this level of extreme extremity. It's all been tested on flumes or on slow moving rivers. So you had to pick the most suitable models to allow for this. It's a real stress test for the existing theories as we have it, because there is nothing else that attempts to cover this sort of uh, section of modeling. Uh, I have some outputs here that I'll fly through since we are very low on time. Uh, red is uh, erosion, blue is deposition. Uh, as you can see, you can see as the reds sort of come in and you have them, uh, the sort of variance here that you'll see that very quickly becomes uh, de deposition based. And you also see this dead zone of where no processes occur at all. And then this incredibly heavy head cutting uh, as it returns to a single, single channel. Uh, and then I also have for uh, sediment concentration, which is the concentration of sediment within the flow. Uh, 
let me just get that through. You can see as the sediment pulse comes through, you can see it's very high concentrations, up to 5,000, sorry, 50,000 there. Very, very high concentrations. But as you can see, very little of it actually gets downstream. Uh, it's um, an interesting observation. And you can see the other class as well as we move through. So as I approach the end here, we have the synthesis of what we can understand from this. So initial results from my study suggest a very poor connectivity, which would suggest that this process that's been observed does indeed exist. Uh, and also suggests that um, the models are logical and that the modeling in these sorts of environments is possible, but not without its drawbacks. And therefore to uh, handle for those drawbacks, we look to refine the model further through solution guided meshing, sorry, solution guided modeling to uh, ensure that gaps in the data and anomalous uh, modeling results are removed. And also to repeat on a historical basis uh, with historical positions and on further sites. Uh, to investigate how extreme events can affect this and also how we can manage eco-hydraulically in line with hydraulic processes on these proglacial sites. And I hope I'm within time. Thank you for listening. It's very ice to meet you. Glaciers are cool. I can't think of more glacier puns. I apologize for the ones I've already made. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good day. Uh, how do I stop recording? There we are. I thank you so much indeed, and thank you for injecting, I would call it humour, but I'm not entirely sure those glacial puns uh, really count that far, but I really appreciate it. It's very interesting, and it's, it's interesting picking up on this theme of extreme uh, events and how they're going to impact our understanding um, of, of um, uh, the systems that, that we're all studying. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how else that thing particularly gets picked up. So as I thank you ever so much indeed for that presentation. Um, the next person um, that I'd like to invite to speak next, and I apologize for my pronunciations, um, is Xiao uh, Shang uh, He, is that how I pronounce it? Very badly, I'm sure, but thank you ever so much. Very much look forward to hearing a little bit more about uh, solutions for carbon neutrality at your particular university. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, hello everyone, I'm Yue Zhang He from uh, Tsinghua University, sorry. Uh, and my topic is potential solutions for carbon neutrality at Tsinghua University. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, addressing climate change becomes a consensus around the world and hundreds of higher education institutions uh, have already announced their uh, carbon neutrality target no later than 2050. And 18, uh, 15 universities uh, established a GOC to advance uh, climate change solutions together. Tsinghua University is a member of GOC. Well, it has yet to commit, uh, to commit carbon neutrality and don't have a specific, uh, don't have a specific uh, target. So our, uh, so our research is to uh, provide some advice and uh, for for the target uh, for Tsinghua University to set uh, to uh, realize carbon neutrality. Tsinghua University is located in Beijing, China. It has an active population of more than eighty thousand, which is a large energy consumption group. And based on greenhouse gas protocol, we calculated scope one and scope two emissions in two thousand and nineteen. As the table show, as the table shows, uh, electricity accounted for nearly two thirds of the total emissions. And based on investigation and the university future plan, uh, we concluded the ma two major growth point of energy consumption in the future is uh, uh, heating and electricity in additional storage and uh, electricity consumption in inventory space. Over the past decade, uh, Tsinghua University Ha, has already made great achievements uh, in building a green campus and limiting the uh, carbon dioxide emission increase. Well, there is still a great gap to uh, realize net zero. So we came up with the comprehensive solutions for uh, carbon neutrality at Tsinghua University. And based on technical maturity, cost and feasibility, we summarized the five pillars. The first pillar is zero carbon heating. The main thought is to uh, replace the gas uh, by renewable energy like geotherm and power. We also need to develop wastewater recovery recovery system and 
seasonal energy uh, storage system to improve our efficiency and meet our need. Second pillar is zero carbon power. Uh, we have three uh, strategies. Uh, these are uh, grid decarbonization, distributed solar power, and green power purchasing. The third pillar is uh, building energy efficiency. Through air techniques enhancement and intelligent monitoring, we set a target for Tsinghua University to improve its uh, building energy efficiency. The last two pillars are electrification of transportation and cooking and using uh, nature-based solutions uh, to manage our uh, campus carbon sink. So next we uh, design two scenarios and uh, set some key assumptions for our research. The difference between the two scenarios is the uh, application of the pillars. This slide shows the result uh, of, of the two scenarios. From the carbon emission pathways, we can see that Tsinghua University can achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 or even earlier. Uh, from the green part, we can see that uh, great decarbonization will be the uh, biggest uh, contribution to carbon dioxide emission reduction. Uh, and through a uh, comparison of the two scenarios, we can see that building energy efficiency has greater potential to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and makes clean heating replacement much easier. Also, solar, uh, solar power plays a significant, uh, significant role before 2030. And if we want to reach net zero by 2041, purchasing green electricity is inevitable. Uh, although our results uh, may be positive, uh, we, still need, uh, we still need enough support to help us realize that goal. And if we make it, uh, it, it has significant meanings and co-benefits for our university. That's all, thank you. That's really interesting, thank you so much. And I think this issue about how we're going to achieve net zero um, at scale is going to be really interesting. So taking a case study such as yours, and then thinking about how we can uh, expand uh, it to other universities, but also what it might mean um, to the wider communities is, is really fascinating. So thank you very much indeed for sharing that uh, presentation. Um, next up, um, we have Yu King, um, who's going to be thinking about carbon sequestration. So thinking about the role of um, nature, but in a very different way to what we've been hearing uh, thus far. So without further ado, um, Yu King, would you like to um, present your paper for us? Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much indeed. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Chin, and I'm a PhD candidate at Tsinghua University. It's my great honor to share my works. Climate change has become one of the significant challenges for human society to achieve the sustainable development. Since the climate change conferences, many countries have mainly focused their policy efforts on controlling carbon dioxide emission to tackle climate change in energy, industry, and so on. And the series of measures for energy saving and energy transformation has been carried out. However, the GAP report pointed out that there was still a gap between the carbon dioxide emissions and its targets. The carbon emission reduction scheme in counter bottlenecks, the nature better solution could be become a beneficial supplement. In our study, the nature better solution specifically refers to using the carbon dioxide flexing capacity of the waters and the organism to form a water blue carbon poles. The solutions can fight climate change in two ways. On the one way, they are explaining the environmental capacity of the carbon dioxide on the other race, building a sustainable carbon circle system. Our conception map is beautiful and desirable, but how to realize? In my views, the following question should be considered when we wanted to incorporate the carbon sequestration into lack management.
Seven years ago, I started majoring in environmental science in Wuhan. During that time, from the perspectives of different stakeholders, I found that the research and the management of the lag carbon sequestration lag behind. Wuhan is a typical lag city. However, the main focus of the lag management has always been water quality. The lack of the management framework and the strategies to enhance the lag carbon sequestration capacity with the water quality improvement is similar to many countries. For the uh, there more, uh, our study could also provide essential references for lag management in other regions of China and even other countries worldwide. In this study, three research contents were conducted to answer the following questions. The VGPM model calculated the primary productivity for each period of the lag. Although the carbon sequestration of lag was lower than that of the China coastal water, the carbon sequestration per unit error was slightly higher. The result indicated that the lag has significant carbon sequestration potential and provides us with a potential perspective for fight climate change. The listed data structure was used to express the core scale relationship between water and the land environment factors for the first time. Furthermore, a conceptual model was proposed and the mathematical models were constructed for fitting. This result would provide critical information for following research. Finally, some managed strategies were exposed. This study puts forward the concept theory of the LISM system and it was and it was defined as a com com complex uh, adaptive system with a mo motor objectives and emergency. LISM consists of the four sub, -sub systems through the complex changes of the individual behavior and the interaction relationship, the carbon sequestration and the water quality emerging have changed at the micro level. The meta agent simulation model of LISM was established and the three scenario simulation was carried out by Latinox of the whale. And uh, we found some unexpected results. First, uh, first is water temperature scenarios. The second is the under point source pollutant emission scenarios. The third is the under fish culture scenarios. Finally, the policy recommendations were proposed to lack protection and further to provide a new perspective on climate change, which are as follow. Firstly, adopt the management framework of the LISM and take the carbon sequestration as a vital goal contributing to fighting climate change. Secondly, form the sustainable carbon circle life system by adopting the coordinated regulation strategy of the water quality and the biology. Thirdly, take lack carbon sequestration capacity as an essential reference for regional carbon emission benchmark value, especially in China. That's all. Thank you. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. And this issue of, of um, uh, carbon sequestration is, is very much that X factor when it comes to um, achieving carbon neutrality. Um, we know we need to do it, but how do we go ahead and do it? So it's, it's really fascinating to hear active research which is going on, which has clearly identified policy um, uh, relevant applications. So thank you very much indeed for, for sharing that, that research indeed. Um, we're going to move swiftly on now to um, uh, Trisha uh, Gopalakrishna, um, who works with us here at the University of Oxford. Tricia, would you like to uh, present your paper? Hi, can you hear me and can you see the screen? We can indeed. I don't know whether you want to be able to put your camera on or not. Um, that's entirely your choice. Uh, sure, if I can get it to work. Um, so, <laughs> there, there we go. go. Well done. Thank you. Okay, so hi, my name is Trisha Gopalakrishna, and I'm going to be speaking to you about the forest, uh, the mit mitigation potential of forest restoration in India. And um, let's see if my slides move forward. Yep, I am a DPhil candidate and the Oxford Indira Gandhi 2019 scholar at the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. So as you have heard from Cecile, uh, forest restoration 
uh, seems to be a promising land-based option uh, because of its relatively low costs, multiple co-benefits and scalability, and hence is widely being um, thought of as a panacea for climate change mitigation. And there are many global studies that highlight broad scale patterns driven by global scale processes, but are limited in their ability to account for locally specific information in regions or countries which can easily deviate from global estimates. And this point is crucial because various countries have made national and international pledges to restore forests to limit rising temperatures. India is one such country with ambitious goals as part of its nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement. However, there has been limited assessment of the feasibility of these goals and which regions within India are most appropriate to expand forest and tree cover, which is the motivation of this study. So we define the area of opportunity uh, for forest restoration as all land area within India that could sustain natural forests at biophysically appropriate forest canopy densities without compromising non-forest endemic ecosystems and without endangering food security and the resulting cumulative sequestration potential by naturally regenerating forests in the area of opportunity is the climate change mitigation potential that we calculate in this study. And consequently, we also estimated the mitigation potential of agroforestry considering only agri-silvicultural systems at the national scale. So on the slide, you see the overall methodology to calculate the area of opportunity for forest restoration and agroforestry. Uh, the results uh, that we estimated are that there's an additional opportunity of 1.58 million hectares for forest restoration and 14.67 million hectares for agroforestry, which again is only a national estimate. So the 1.58 million hectares for forest restoration is indicated by the orange sliver in each bar on the plot shown. And as you can see, it varies across regions of India and also varies across states. So the different regions are uh, arranged in from left to right in decreasing amount of area of opportunity. So the central Indian states have the highest area of opportunity of half a million hectares, while the western Indian states have the least. And within each region, the states are arranged from top to bottom in decreasing amount of area of opportunity. So the state of Chhattisgarh in central India has the highest area of opportunity for forest restoration, while the state of Goa in the western Indian states has the least. We then uh, used um, the uh, information of carbon pools, except for soil organic carbon, to calculate the cumulative carbon stocks that could naturally regenerate uh, in the 1.58 million hectares. And we estimated that the additional mitigation potential uh, for forest restoration is 61.3 ter teragrams for carbon. And for agroforestry, it's 98.1 teragrams for carbon, which again is a national estimate. Uh, the top five states with the highest mitigation potential for forest restoration are indicated by arrows on the map on the slide. So what does all of this mean? Um, so our estimates for forest restoration especially and that of area is consistently lower when compared to um, estimates from global studies as shown on the bar plot. And uh, the main reason for this is that our study accounts for the fine scale variation of land uses and land covers across India and additional factors. And also because our choice of exclusion of different uh, uh, uses and covers that cannot be restored is very strict. And um, our uh, study reaffirms the pattern of overestimation of uh, mitigation potential for forest restoration in global studies. And this is going to probably be the case in many other countries in the tropics. And there are parallels between this case study and that of some African countries like Chad, Sudan, Somalia. And our estimates, again, for mitigation potential from both forest restoration and agroforestry is only about 19 to 23% of India's pledge to the Paris Agreement, which is important information to keep in mind in order to inform uh, more realistic pledges. And lastly, our estimates of um, mitigation potential from, again, both forest restoration and agroforestry is only 17 uh, total. So this is the cumulative is only 17% of India's greenhouse gas emission reductions for one year alone. That's 2018. So it's very limited. And uh, it, this finding underscores the fact that um, nature-based solutions, and in this case, forest restoration and agroforestry, uh, can only be 
a couple of strategies uh, to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, greenhouse immense greenhouse gas reductions, uh, emissions reductions need to be achieved and by other sectors, especially energy. So uh, that's about it. If you need more information about the methods, you can refer to the longer presentation. And if you have any questions, yeah, we're happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you. Patricia, thank you so much indeed for that presentation. Again, it just really highlights that once we've got this need to achieve these mitigation um, targets and everyone says forestry is, is really important, we recognize that actually there's competing um, demand for, for, for land use. Plant a tree, you can't plant crops. Is it important to feed a nation, et cetera? So it's really fascinating to hear the work that you're doing and particularly in an area which often the finger is pointed um, where they're not doing enough. So it's really interesting to see that there is really constructive work that, that's, that's coming out of the research which you're doing. So thank you very much indeed. And just to reiterate um, what uh, Tricia said, if you do have any um, questions that you'd like to uh, pose to our panelists um, as, as we're going along, then please use the chat function. I'm noticing a couple that have, that have already been um, posted um, as well. So thank you for doing that. But um, there will be some time at the end to, to uh, pose those extra questions. Um, but also to the panelists, thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, I know it's very difficult to summarize some very technical um, papers which you've written uh, as some very interesting research to a very short space of time, but you're all doing brilliantly. So thank you very much indeed for that. So Without further ado, um, I'd like to invite, uh, hopefully um, Pai Zhang um, is able to, to give out his presentation, um, or rather their presentation. Um, I know that there were some technical difficulties making um, uh, them an attendee, um, uh, rather a panelist. So we can see uh, presentation slides. And if Pai, if you wanted to, um, uh, Put your camera on as well. We we would love to see um, see you. Otherwise, thank you very much. Very much. Look forward to hearing your uh, about your paper. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, something wrong with my uh, laptop camera. So I can just share you with my uh, slides and without the video. Yeah. So sorry for that. So uh, that's, can you hear me? Sorry, that's, that's, sorry, just to say that's absolutely fine. And my apologies for, for jumping in, but just to reassure you, um, it's great to hear your voice and, and to see your, your slide. So thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so uh, it's a great honor for me to share my research. I'm Pei, a PhD candidate from the University of Cambridge. So I studied the political ecology of millet growing in Anhan, China. Uh, Ohan Banner is in the southeast of Chifeng city in the Mongolia. Its landscape and climate type are very suitable for the dryland farming of core cereals. So when I first traveled to Ohan, I was really impressed by the hundreds of hectares of millet fields and a diversity of millet varieties. Millet is the second largest crop in Ohan, second only to maize. So according to archeological evidence, the history of Alhamulit can date back to 7,700 to 8,000 years ago, which proves that Alhan is the center of origin of millet. So for its biodiversity and culture diversity, Alhan dryland farming system was honored as the global important agricultural heritage system by the FAO in 2012. So since then, the millet industry has flourished with the promotion of local government, as we can see the trend in the figure one. I would like to know more about the seed industry of millet in Alhan. So I invested that, investigated that village. It's a middle-sized village with 13 village groups and 1,046 residents. There are more than 16 and 100 mu of confirmed arable land and more than 9,000 mu of which are planted with millet this year. So we can see in table one, Jingmiao K1 is the largest planted millet variety this year. It's a new herbicide resistant variety, which was bred from the variant of the traditional variety Jingmiao. This new variety was first introduced in Liaoning province, another province of China in 2018. 
a village, a villager in that village learned from his relatives in Liaoning that Jing Liao K1 can produce high yields with high quality creams. So he first grew Jing Liao K1 in his own village in 2019. It turns out that Jing Liao K1 selling price is higher than other varieties. So therefore, the variety has spread all over the village since 2020. So we can see in the table two, it shows the changes of varieties in that village. Though millet varieties are becoming more abundant, but in each period, period, only a few varieties become mainstream. All of this reveal a fact that the germplasm resources are narrowing. So for example, we can see from these pictures, here are a dozen of different varieties that are, brown, are bred from Jingmiao series. Despite the increasing diversity of millet variety, germplasm resource are increasingly narrowing. The disappearing local varieties not only takes away the genes they carry, but also the local culture attached to them. My research also analyzed the decision-making process of different stakeholders on seed varieties. For example, farmers pursue high yields and a good price of grains. Seed companies are concerned about the cost of breeding and seed proliferation, while grain processors focus on the high rate of producing rice with low costs. Breeders no longer serve purely for breeding research, but join the trend of pursue, pursuing short-term profit for maintain goals of increasing variety yields and expanding the area of promotion of new varieties. So these consequences are varieties that meets the interest of market survived while the rest are gradually disappearing. So as a peasant said, even if it's an extremely drought year, the millet will head out small and short yields and people could survive. In the context of climate change, the international community has paid more attention to the coarse and ancient cereal in recent years. Millet has been recognized for its climate resistance and nutritional benefit and the potential to help us to move away from intensive farming of major cereals such as maize, rice, and wheat. I would like to highlight the importance of seeds in this report context, the millet seeds Germplasm is important strategic, stra strategic resources to ensure national food security and food sovereignty, especially in a warming world. It's undeniable that the National Germplasm Bank is significant to long-term conservation and scientific research. However, as a formal seed system, its method is off-site conservation. In this way, seeds deposited in cold storage lose the possibility of genetic mutations to adapt to the environment. So we need to pay more attention to farmer's seed system like community seed bank in showed in this picture. My research reveals the dynamics of the seed, millet seed industry in Alhan. After, uh, after this policy review and field work, I researched, I reached three main standpoints and conclusions as well as three main policy suggestions. So due to the time limits, I'm not going to explain them in great detail. So that's all of my research. Thanks for your listening. I mute myself. Thank you so much. Um, and again, just really fascinating to hear one of the um, uh, key problems is how do you feed um, a nation um, when you have um, a fundamental food crop um, that is uh, likely to be impacted uh, by climate change. And it's not always obvious um, which way um, it will go, depending on um, what happens with, with regards to the changing climate and, and, and the impacts it brings. And it's interesting to hear this idea of scale. So not everything has to be at that national scale. Working at that community level is really important in being able to uh, identify solutions um, to the uh, problems which we're going to be facing with regards to um, climate change. So this issue of scale, I think, is fascinating. So thank you for introducing that to us in, in your presentation. So what we'd like to do now is, is to move on, uh, again, thinking about a slightly different um, perspective on the role of, of nature uh, as a potential solution um, to the impacts of, of climate change and, and uh, in response 
Um, we'd like to invite um, Shen Tao Sun, um, again, apologies for my pronunciations, um, to give um, the presentation um, now, if that's possible, please. We can see the slide, but we can't hear a voice. Is that work? There you go. Brilliant. Thank you so okay, much thanks. indeed. Very looking, okay, very looking forward to hearing this. Okay, okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sun Zhen Tao, currently an engineering master's student at Tsinghua University. I appreciate to participate in the forum by sharing some, some research work of our team and some of my points of view. I would like to talk about some key technical issues in ecological restoration of selling alkalis so or towards achieving carbon neutrality. My presentation consists of two, four parts. Part one, the SDGs pro posed by United Nations in 2015 called on uh, all countries to promote pro spread to while protecting the planet, take urgent action to com combat climate change and its impacts is very important for us. Now we are facing a wild range of global problems. Achieving carbon neutrality standards it, to deal with the challenge of global climate change is the way to solve some of the agricultural techniques that reduce carbon emissions and increase carbon sinks urgently need scientific re responses and assessment. I would like to introduce some works of my team. We use FTG gypsum improves the situation of selling outlines or that what is FTG gypsum? It is byproduct of FTGs. And uh, what is sending out like soil? It generally uh, refers to soil which contains many soils or sodiums. We found that we are facing many problems related to FTG gypsums and uh, alkali land such as FGD gypsum has already created new environmental problems and uh, 701 point uh, percent of world's land is affected by salinity. So we applying FGD gypsum to saline alkali soil based on mechanisms of alumni. Thus over 25 thousand hectares land has been restored since 1995, covering 17 provinces or regions in China. This is a com completed project in Jilin province, China. We can see the land changes a lot through satellite pictures. Then I would like to talk about some key technical issues. Agriculture activities affect carbon sources and carbon. Current research pays more attention to changes. Farmland SOC reserves, while relative few studies balances, changes in SOC reserves and non-CO2 greenhouse ga gas emissions. Selling alkaline soil carbon source or seek contribution and uncertainty. There are very few studies on the contribution of carbon sequestration to selling alkaline land, and there are significant uncertainties in that carbon sequestration intensity. The essential technique means and issues of agricultural science to support carbon 
responsibility. This part of research also lack long-term and effective international cooperation. As a natural, natural climate solution, so organic carbon can respond to repeated land use changes and climate change by restoring carbon sinks and preventing further CO2 emissions. There are three suggestions I give about. This is our team. Okay, thanks all my today's work. Everyone can contact me by these ways. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation. Again, it's a really interesting uh, issue that we have to face. And when you suddenly realize numbers such as uh, I think you said 7% um, of, of uh, uh, land surface area is, is going to be affected. We suddenly realize um, just how important it is that we look for solutions um, um, to this uh, particular problem. So thank you very much for introducing your research um, on that thank area. Thank you. Thank you. So... What I'd like to do now is there's a slight change in um, emphasis in terms of our presentation. We're going to be thinking about the role of non-governmental non organizations in the process of, of uh, climate and nature solutions. Um, and to present on that, um, I'd like to invite um, he, um, Shuing Wee, my apologies again, um, if you're on, uh, if you could uh, present your paper around, um, around this issue. Okay. Are they online? Maybe if they can drop me a quick note in the um, chat, then um, uh, we can get your presentation loaded up. Um, but in the meantime, ooh, he is, I'm just told. But I can't see where... Okay, well, let's move swiftly on um, and maybe we can sort out that presentation uh, in, a, uh, in a minute. Um, do we have um, uh, Heng Kang Xu um, available to, to give their paper in the meantime? <laughs> we do have right how do i find the raised hand there we are right so let me promote you to a panelist And hopefully, there we go. Okay, can you hear me? We can indeed. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your understanding with, with the technical okay. issues. And that goes for everybody on and, this and uh, webinar as well. So thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, yeah. And okay. we can see we can see your slides if you want to start it. Okay. The moment we can. Hello. Me? Can you hear me? We can indeed, yes. And we can see your slides now, and we can see your videos. So we're we're good to go. 
Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Xu Hengkang. I'm a PhD student of China Agricultural University. It's an honor, honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Today's topic is so organic carbon increased by uh, bill crust across in arid areas. My presentation is divided into three parts. Uh, the first, uh, what is biological soil crust? The second is what are the ecological function of biological soil crust? Uh, the final, what's the effect of biological soil crust on soil organic carbon? So what is, uh, what is uh, biological soil crust? Uh, biological soil crust is a composite uh, organic formed on the surface of soil consists of soil particle and uh, semi-biotry, olage, microfungi, leaking, and bio uh, biofis in arid and similar land through the world where the cover of veg is spare or absence. The open spares between the high plants are generally not bare of autotrophic life but covered by a community of highly spilized organisms. The biological soil crust is a compostable organic formed on the first of soil consists of soil particles and the early leakings of breeds. The tips of biological soil crust are usually divided into early crust, leaking crust, and moss crust. They have different shape and conditions and it can be found in a radar and similar radar of the world. So next, I will introduce what's the uh, ecological function of uh, uh, biosol crust. Biosol crust play an important uh, role in carbon, nitrogen, and the phosphorus uh, silly, surface reading and uh, hydrology. Biological soil crust are directly or indirectly related to plants micro organisms, soil and animal, and have irreplaced e ecological functions. So what's the effect of uh, biological soil on organic carbon? We found the pre soil study on carbon ceiling, mainly came from location experiments in disturbed areas, and the progress of increased uh, organic carbon by biological crust is clear at present. Study have shown that uh, Bio crust soil can fix a large amount of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and different type of biology crust have different carbon sequence ability. So we use a meta analysis to explore this question. Uh, we search for pro preview publication in China National College in France structure and web of science use the search terms carbon uh, biological and so on. We build the data classic. Uh, we, we build the database about uh, the different uh, bio soil crust, uh, ecology system, soil and climate, soil nutrition, and uh, elements activity. So we found the different types of uh, biological soil crust have different carbon sequence ability, and most and the leaking have a strong positive effect on um, so organic carbon than alleged crust and the mixed crust capture more organic carbon and the carbon dioxide. With the alternate increase, the, the so uh, organic carbon connect increase first and then decrease. The, the so organic carbon connect decrease first and then increase with the annual mean temperature. So uh, organic carbon connect increase with the increase of annual mean evaporation. Uh, last, uh, we found the soil organic carbon was scientifically connected with the soil enemy activity. And the uh, nature, the freedom, the random forced analysis shows that uh, the two nitrogen could be considered as a director of the concern of uh, so organic carbon followed by the climate. So to summarize, 
So nitrogen connect is more important for organic carbon accumulators than climate factors. And the potential of a biological crust for carbon fiction should be emphasized. Our findings highlight the remarkable contribution of fixed cultures to soil carbon pools. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, conclude my report with a line from an ancient poem of the Qin Dynasty. Most flowers are small as rice, also like a pony in full bloom. Thank you, that's all. Thank you so much indeed. And I think it's it's always good. Um, so we had Zaid introducing humor into presentations. I think it's really good that we're able to introduce some art and poetry um, just to remind us um, about the humanity of the problem which we're actually facing. And I think the the other interesting thing that, that the presentation um, presented to me was actually, you know, it's not about necessarily the big trees. It's not necessarily about the um, uh, the highly visible uh, areas that, that we need to address and that can provide solutions. That it's actually the the uh, smaller areas that, that we need to think about and the role that it plays. Because once it's uh, manifested its scale, all of a sudden um, it does provide that uh, invaluable resource. So it's a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much indeed um, uh, for sharing that that with us. The next person that I'd like to uh, introduce um, is actually a, a replacement, Josh Wollstenholm, um, is very kindly presenting on behalf of uh, Katie Parsons from the University of Hull um, around hedgerows. Um, so Josh, thanks ever so much for stepping in. Um, we're very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. We can see your slides. Okay, great, thank you. Hopefully we can hear your voice. Excellent. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not quite Katie, uh, who is meant to be presenting, but unfortunately she can't. But thank you very much for having me. So, uh, my name is Josh. I'm a research assistant at the University of Hull, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about our hedgehunters' work. So this is the element of our wider project that I'm the lead on that Katie works on. So in the UK alone, hedgerows comprise of an estimated 2.6 million tons of carbon, and these hedgerows are vitally important biodiversity corridors that provide an important role in controlling hydrological pathways. And gaps within the many thousands of miles of hedgerows across the UK are potential, potential suitable sites for the circa one and a half billion trees that the UK aims to plant by 2050 as part of addressing the carbon net zero targets. Now, filling these gaps within hedgerows, which take up less space than large forests, could be very, a very valuable contribution that may help avoid the need for a wide area of planting and extensive landscape change. So one, one side of our project is about combining remote sensing and artificial intelligence to determine the amount and scale of hedgerow gaps. However, this work additionally needs a validation, and we're doing this using both GIS and field surveys, which in turn guides the artificial intelligence routines. The other dimension to the project what I'm presenting on mainly here today is understanding that to bring together the ambition of fostering a greener society and to meet the net zero goals, we need to ensure that children and youth are engaged with environmental concerns and have the right skills and knowledge for future careers. So as part of this, we've been working with the Youth Climate Champions to co-develop the Hedgehunter interface, a tool to be used by citizen scientists nationally for hedgerow surveying and environmental sciences research, and encouraging citizens to contribute from home whilst inspiring outdoor activity and learning. So, as I said, Hedgehunters was co-created in partnership with a youth, a local youth organisation dedicated to encouraging environmental social action. And by involving citizens in the design and implementation of the project, we are encouraging our climate champions to both take ownership and to participate. And through embedding envir environmental knowledge and understanding, it can lead to future pro-environmental behaviours, which in turn will create a nation of climate champions. So what are the methods that we're using? Uh, we, we've used a toolbox of creative participatory uh, research methods, giving young people the skills and the knowledge to understand the data sets that are required for this work and also why they're required. So these involve things like art via photography, creating podcasts and blogs that the youth climate champions are working on at the moment, 
creative mapping and utilizing digital technologies, which are becoming especially important in the current climate with home learning and working from home. We're also collecting before and after surveys to understand how knowledge and pro-environmental behaviours evolve over the project, whilst trialling fieldwork techniques and developing outdoor learning methods with the youth climate champions, as you can see there in the picture. So Hedgehunters includes a smartphone device or similar to contribute new data into a database of hedgerow characteristics. So these are things like the location of the hedge, which is collected automatically from the GPS in the device, size, shape, density, and gap size. And we've also got soil characteristics. So things like the moisture, the type and texture, acidity, vegetation, stone content, including performing little experiments like a um, person in the picture has done there or like a little sausage. And we're also looking at biodiversity, so different species of the hedgerow and local wildlife species, as well as classifying the region. And our purpose, um, the, our participants, I should say as well, will also upload images and videos via the survey app. So the purpose of Hedgehunters is to support and augment the artificial intelligence work that I've mentioned before, and to involve the youth climate champions in active scientific research, whilst enhancing their environmental and digital knowledge. But what are the impacts of these projects? Well, currently we're able to identify all of the hedgerows and hedgerow gaps to about an 82-83% accuracy across the East Riding of Yorkshire in a little over a day, as well as extract hedgerow metrics like I mentioned before, such as the length, the height and connectivity. And whilst doing this, we're also raising awareness of the environmental issues within society. So, so through using this vast range of technologies, we are hoping to raise aspirations and perceptions of science outdoor learning and skill development. And we want to create a nation that not only cares about their environment, but actively engages with it, understanding its processes and its needs so that we and they can look after it for years to come. So this project is very much still ongoing uh, and the next steps are really exciting. So for us as researchers, we aim to have a national rollout of the Hedgehunters application, including an online database of all the gaps in hedgerows that may be suitable for planting. We would like the school resources that we are developing to go to every school and they'll be freely available online uh, so that children, parents and teachers can take part in being a hedge hunter and to start to understand why our hedgerows are so important. And finally, you might have noticed that I said before, what was important for us as researchers? Well, as this project has grown, our youth climate champions have started an agenda of their own and identified goals and aims that they want to do within the project. So this outcome alone shows why arming young people with knowledge, understanding and participation in real life scientific research is so important. They have now taken the reins and are beginning to, fund, uh, beginning to bring in funding from their own ideas. So one such is the authoring of an illustrated series of 15 children's books. Our champions deter were determined that uh, children needed to know about the creatures that live in our hedgerows and how we need to protect them from the harm that they are potentially facing. So the young people applied for some funding to publish the book, ensuring that they would be able to give a copy to every school in Hull and East Riding as part of their quest to educate for free. There is no stopping this group of young people, but what they and we now want to do is grow our hedgehunter network so that everybody, small or big, can come, become a part of our team. So thank you very much for listening. Josh, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And again, just reminds us of the importance of scale in terms of who we're engaging and why we're engaging with them. We've heard several examples of uh, stakeholder engagement at the uh, community level and the work that you're doing, working with young people, um, getting buy-in, getting that interest. And that's often one of the areas which we say within academia is we don't get enough of. Um, and that's buy-in and that's interest in the work that we're doing. So to hear the work that you're doing is fascinating. So thank you very much indeed um, for sharing that. And also bearing in mind that, that the point of this summit is around giving um, the uh, global youth a voice um, and you're certainly having that opportunity. So thank you very much indeed for sharing that. And again, thanks for stepping, uh, stepping in and uh, helping out uh, when, when Katie wasn't able to, to be with us. So again, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you. we move on to our last speaker. Very much looking forward um, to hearing from um, Lin Bing um, Zhuang um, about um, monitoring techniques.
So, Limbing, are you with us? I'm here, I'm here. Excellent. I can hear your voice. Yeah. We can see some slides. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, maybe I'm That's the last brilliant. speaker today. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lin Bing Zhuang from San Yat-sen University, and I have another partner, Niang Fa Liu. He's now studying in University of Salzburg in Austria. And our topic today is monitoring co-blend impact on NDVI and nitrogen dioxide among four counties in Guangdong with Google Earth engine. And Guangdong is uh, one of the province in China. As we all know that agriculture is one basic industrial industry, uh, industry in uh, national economic. The government needs to manage its operation in the long term. But in fact, this ability mainly depends on the, the available information. Uh, for some reasons, the long term agricultural mapping and monitoring is still so challenging. And some studies have shown that remote sensing can be one of the most reliable approaches to get detailed information. And here are some examples. And in our study, we use Google Earth Engine as a very useful tool to carry out our methodological framework. Let me first introduce Google Earth Engine for you. It is a, group, it is a web portal that can provide us with data from uh, time series satellite, satellite imagery and uh, cloud-based cloud computing, and also access to uh, software and algorithm to process data. Here I point out three main advantages of GE, and its, advantage, uh, its application was quite varied uh, from forest and vegetation to medical research. And in our study, we select four counties in Guangdong province with the highest value added of primary industry. You can see in this photo, uh, they, are, they are Guangzhou, Dianbai, Lezhou, and Lianjiang, all of them located in the uh, southwest of China, uh, southwest of Guangdong. They are of they are of tropical monsoon climate with abundant sunshine and rainfall, and agriculture already plays an important role in this area. And the remote sensing indices using this for our study is uh, normalized difference vegetation index and nitrogen dioxide, we call NDVI and NO2. Here are some examples of uh, how they have been introduced for agricultural monitoring. And as the time is so limited, I won't show you more detail about how we get the data and process them. If you are interested in this, you can contact me later. I show you the uh, result map, uh, quite a lot of result map of these four counties. Uh, uh, let, me, let me describe the findings of Dianbai for you. As you can see in this three photo, um, with the help of Google Earth Engine, we can show you the distribution of the character uh, of the of three indices we monitor. And we found that we found that the characteristic of coplane coverage and nitrogen dioxide are a little similar. Especially they all have a especially they all have a highest value in the southeast, southeast of the Empire. And also uh, from the result of NDVI, this red line is the trend line of uh, vegetation level, which means that uh, it's very standable from 2014 to 2021, which means that the green area in Dianbai hasn't changed a lot for years. And here are a uh, result map in other counties. I will show you more. Uh, you can see that from the material where I download on the website. Here comes the conclusion. In our study, we use uh, GEE to observe the characteristics, to observe the distribution of some um, some, mon some monetary indices. 
and we still cannot find a very confirmed relationship among them in our study. Uh, this means that we need to find more data sources and evidence to deliver our study. And for governments, if uh, maybe the more reliable data, the data and information they get, the better they can do uh, in policy and program making. So we hope that with our that uh, with more facial temporal data, our research could better help them uh, in sustainable agricultural and environmental development. That's all of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Limbing. It's amazing to hear the diversity of uh, uh, data gathering techniques which we're employing um, within this broad sphere of, of climate and nature from some very um, high-tech satellite imagery, artificial intelligence, to some of the more hands-on uh, techniques that we heard from Josh just a moment ago, um, getting children um, engaged, getting literally their, their hands dirty with, with the data. And I think it's it's really important message to get across that it's not just um, one solution is going to uh, help us understand exactly what's going on, that we need to employ the full range of techniques and even take techniques from other uh, branches of science and look how we can implement them in our own research um, in order to uh, understand exactly what it is that's going on and what we can do about it. So thanks ever so much for presenting um, on, on the data that, that you've been uh, working on. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Good. We have got through all of our presentations and I'm sure you'll agree that they are incredible. They were all incredibly fascinating, um, diverse, but all reflect the importance of considering the role of nature and biodiversity in understanding um, climate, both from its impacts, but also from a solution perspective as well. And not just on um, uh, an individual scale, not just in one particular part of the world, but recognizing that it's a global problem that, require, that requires global solutions and global understandings, global cooperation as well. What I'd like to do um, is to ask whether anybody um, has any questions for our panelists. Um, we do have a little bit of time available to us if anybody would like to ask one. Please to raise your hand um, and then we can uh, unmute you. Okay, so it doesn't look like anyone's got any questions, which is fine. It just goes to show that the presentations that, that we heard gave all the information that was possibly needed. So well done to the panelists who presented. What I would like to do though, just in this final um, uh, 15 minutes that we have, is to go back to our panelists. The point of this um, presentation is um, rather the, uh, form, the, the forum um, is to provide a voice um, to get a message over to the um, uh, delegates who are going to be attending COP next week. So what I'd like is to invite each of the panelists just to very quickly um, just say what it, what is it what message rather about your research would you like to get across? to the delegates that they would take forward um, within the negotiations. So if we can go through the order with which we um, uh, uh, were, were presenting in, I think that that would be good. So Saeed, would you like to kick us off? What message based on your research would you like to get to the delegates who are gonna be conducting the negotiations in the next couple of weeks? Um, well, I think, there's a there's a caveat when it comes to how governments approach trying to solve climate change. They're trying to look wait for this um, miracle technology from researchers like ourselves that is suddenly going to fix the problem. When in reality, the, the 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 solve to the problem is right in front of them. It's just a choice no one wants to make, and that is the objective choice to reduce your emissions 
despite the costs that it might have economically. So I think uh, the, the, the message I'd like to give to, to COP26, uh, I'm sure it probably will go unheard, is to prioritize the future of our planet over the uh, lining of their wallets uh, in the near future. Powerful message, thank you. And I hope that message won't go unheard because it's pretty much fundamental to the success um, of achieving any kind of negotiation. So what we need to make sure is that we do um, make our voice loud and clear. So, but thank you for that, for that message. Um, moving swiftly on, um, Joao Zhang. Hey, hello. Uh, well, for me, I think that universities can uh, play an important role in addressing climate change. So university can show their leadership and their responsibility uh, when our whole society is going to uh, realize carbon neutrality. And university provides such a great platform to uh, do some research about technology and show their innovation and also provide valuable experiences for uh, other regions and uh, institutions uh, to find their own way to realize uh, carbon neutrality or carbon deep carbon reduction. So I think university can uh, be a, a great uh, part in uh, achieving carbon neutrality. Thank you. Thank, no, thank you. And I think that's a really, a really important message as well regarding the role that universities play and too often, um, certainly within the UK, the um, universities have not been listened to. Um, science has often been um, considered the bad person, but actually, as you say, we do have something that, that we can contribute and it's making sure that the delegates hear the science because evidence-based solutions um, as we know, are always that much more robust. So thank you for your perspective there. Um, uh, Tian. Hello. Hi. I can hear you. We can uh, hear you perfectly. Thank you. Uh, first, I really must recognize the natural best solution is a vital to take climate change. And the solutions can fight climate change in two ways. As soon I just uh, uh, speak uh, on the one way, they are expanding the environmental cap capacity of the carbon dioxide on the rate, building the sustainable carbon circle system. Young's group could promote the nature based solutions to the public. And moreover, we could try to do some interesting and meaningful policy experiences, um, like all research. Some new policies recommendations were proposed to policy makers for management. That's all, thank you. That's a good message. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, I think the key word that I picked up that you used there was meaningful. Um, and I think that's, that's incredibly valuable. And one thing that we've picked up from the presentations today, you know, is that there is meaningful research going out there that engages um, uh, policy um, in a meaningful way. So I think that's, that's, that's a powerful message. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Tricia, I believe, has had to leave because she's teaching um, this I'm afternoon. And actually, are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Excellent. Um, I'll keep it brief. Two points that I would like to um, communicate is one that um, when countries are negotiating about their pledges and trying to increase their pledges considering different timelines, we should keep in mind that it's not about uh, just writing down pledges uh, which are sort of unrealistic and unfeasible. So hopefully delegates can prepare more realistic targets considering all the constraints and limitations for different uh, countries that they're representing. And two, forest restoration has a I personally, in my opinion, um, has a very one-dimensional narrative of if you restore these many he hectares and you get this much uh, uh, mitigation, uh, there's more to it. There are a lot of contrasting outcomes and that needs to be kept in mind. So um, it's not a silver bullet and there's a lot more to unpack before marketing it as the solution that's going to save us from climate change impacts. Okay, with that, I'm actually going to head out because I have to teach a class <laughs> in 10 minutes. So, but thank you all and see you.
Thank you so much, Trish, and appreciate you staying for that, um, sharing your, your thoughts. Um, again, you know, it's, it's picking up on what Jan said, you know, it's making something meaningful to meaningful targets that are actually achievable, um, that we can actually uh, work towards, but recognizing that there is no one single solution, such as planting a lot more trees, that we need to actually have a um, uh, some kind of strategy, an integrated strategy that allows us to um, achieve those those targets. Um, so next is 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 Pai. Yes. Um, so I also have two points I would like to deliver. So first, we should be aware of the differences between the variety diversity and germplasm diversity, as I showed in my research. Uh, as the variety, the number of variety is increasing while the germ plasm is really narrowing. So that's the first point. And the second point is we should pay attention to the role peasants play in the biodiversity conservation because they can just plant different varieties in the field and those variety can adjust to the changing climate. That's what the, germ, the uh, seed bank cannot do. So yeah, the peasants are not uh, ignorant and unrational. They have they have their own knowledge, the local knowledge, indigenous knowledge to conserve the crops, the varieties, and thereby conserve the biodiversity that can um, face the challenge of the climate change. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think that again, you know, that's a really important message building on the role, the role that universities have to play, where we shouldn't actually forget the person, the people um, who are actually doing the farming, who are actually um, uh, engaged with the environment in a way which politicians certainly aren't, but they have um, more knowledge than we too often give credit for. And I think if we can get their voice heard in the next couple of weeks as well. I think that, that will help reinforce exactly what it is that we need to do and remind us why we're doing it. So I think that's a very powerful message. Thank you for that. Um, so we have uh, Zhen Tao. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think young generations are a major force in addressing climate change and also, of course, representing the future. Young from all walks of life are taking actions to address climate change and protect biodiversity wherever they are in the world. At this critical juncture where history is about to be made, we embrace a shared vision to build a future where man can and uh, nature share a community of life and a beautiful world where uh, all life consists uh, in harmony. To this end, as young generations, we, we can do everything. That's all. No, that's very profound. Thank you very much. And again, it's about providing people with a voice, um, but also asking delegates to listen. Um, to what people are saying. And as you say, the younger generation are going to be the ones inheriting even more problems that, that we're facing. So therefore, their voice should be listened to um, as much, if not more, um, than, than some of the crusty people like me. So thank you for that um, insight. Um, thank you. So, um, Heng Kang. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, hey. I, I think uh, I think the uh, um, diversity play an important role in climate change, and uh, we all uh, we don't just focus on what important uh, like play the train uh, because my uh, major is grassland science. So I think we should deal with climate change from the small action of life. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, I just my participation is the. Uh, um, the leaking, the moss, and uh, the small things uh, will be uh, have a, a big role. Yes, that's all. 
and again, that's a really powerful message. You know, it's the small things that will often make the difference, um, be it microbial um, organisms, be it an individual tilling a field. Um, and I think that message needs to come through loud and clear. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Josh. Yeah, I think just to build on what everyone else said, I think it's really important, not only that as universities, we communicate the different options out there, but also that, you know, these the people who it's actually affecting the public understand truly what climate change is and how it affects their local area so that they can understand how to best lobby for the improvements that they want to make. Like, for example, across um, some of the coasts on these riding, people say that, you know, air pollution is an issue. And I'm sure it is in some places, but generally the East Riding has got one of the cleanest airs, you know, in the country. And it's just picking up on buzzwords that are in the news and really communicating to these people, you know, appreciate that. But that's not actually what your issue is here. And make sure you understand it so you can better fight for it in the council elections and in the government. So you're truly represented. Absolutely. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I think there's a huge responsibility in um, how we communicate.